Uh, good morning and welcome to our Bible study today from First Baptist Church. Thank you for joining us as we meet once again. And we're glad you're part of our study time today. We are working on um, the possibility of changing over from our channel 72 over to whatever the other channel is. We've had so many difficulties with our broadcast and the quality is not good. So we're really looking into changing over to that other channel. And uh, as soon as we can get the information out, we're going to try to do that. So our Sunday school will switch over to that time uh, whenever that time starts. And you should be able to notice a big change in quality. I think it's on channel 1012 if you're on cable. Otherwise, I don't know, but we have to find out. I I'm in the dark. I'm in the dark on that right now, but uh, hopefully we're going to be able to improve the quality, the sound, and all of that with this other channel to do that. We first started uh, the TV ministry in 1976, which was a long time ago. Uh, and so it's been going ever since then, but uh, we just haven't been able to put out the quality broadcast and picture that we feel like reflects on First Baptist Church. Anyway. Hey, thanks for joining us. Don't forget our worship service at 11 o'clock and again this evening at 6 o'clock. So join us then and be a part. If you don't feel comfortable yet coming and being a part here, then continue to watch us. And hopefully one of these days we'll be able to see you back here in worship and in Bible study. Today we're looking at a passage from Col Colossians chapter 1, verses 3 through 12. And this is, uh, as Paul often did in his writings, he would write... Uh, what he had to say was in the form of a prayer. So here he is praying for the church at Colossae. And what he has to say, he's kind of saying through this prayer, which is a long prayer, uh, by the way, as we go through that. So uh, we all can share in the ministry of praying for others. And certainly we do. I think most of us pray for our family, pray for our neighbors, our friends, people that we know that we're concerned about and pray for because they're going through an illness or some kind of challenge in life. And so we pray for them on a regular basis. And so we all can do that. We all have the freedom to address God in prayer together. So um, a commitment to pray for others brings the joy of seeing how God works in the lives of people and, what, and things that happen and how he works in other people's lives as well as in our lives too. Well, the setting for this, Colossae was a textile city located in Western Asia Minor. And Paul had never been to this church in Colossae. It, in fact, it was started by Epaphras. He was the one who founded the church, but Paul had heard good things about it, about that church. And so he wrote a letter in the form of a prayer for them and, of course, hoped to visit them at one time. Um, uh, apparently, the church in Colossae was doing really well. And when things go really well, uh, you're, sub 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 well, get the word out, subjected to teachings and doctrines of false teachers. So in every church that Paul had a part in or connected with, always had problems with false teachers, those who were not teaching the true gospel. So that creates problems. And so Paul is addressing this. Be careful in this prayer. Things are going good. Be careful that false teachers don't get in and take over and create problems for the church. Well, he was especially concerned about these false teachers. Be very careful, he says. Watch out. In fact, one place he calls them wolves in sheep's clothing. You know, be careful. They'll sneak up on you and uh, get you when you're not at least expecting it. So he was writing to encourage these believers, to encourage them, uh, to warn them against the false teachings. So we see this in verses 3 through 5. I'll read that first of all. And he starts off, We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all of God's people. The faith and love that spring, that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you have already heard, in the true message of the gospel. So uh, the letter begins with a, with a salutation. And most letters in the New Testament do. Uh, they, the writer identifies himself. He says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus. So he was identifying himself, uh, who, who he was, of Jesus Christ, and including a reference to Timothy, his brother. So he was 
sharing that with those who would read this letter. And of course, the, the recipients were the saints in Colossae. Paul often referred to the members, the Christians, the believers in the church as saints. Uh, we don't use that term very often and call each other saints, but we are. We're saints not because of who we are, what we've done, but because of what Christ did in us. So we can be classified as a saint because of our faith in Jesus Christ. And he extended a um, blessing and grace and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, as he says. Uh, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. When we pray for you. So whenever we pray for you, we pray for uh, blessings and grace and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So the verses for the session consist of Paul's prayer of thanksgiving. So this is a long prayer for their faithfulness, for what they were doing in the church, in and through the church, and a prayer of concern for their spiritual growth, which is always a good prayer to request and to thank for continued growth in the church. So while Paul was the primary author of the letter, he used the first personal, uh, first person plural rather than uh, we, I. He used we when he says we, but of course uh, he was using the, the, person, the plural, plural pronouns, what I was trying to say, when he said we, we. So we did this and we did that, as he says. Well, Paul's expression of thanksgiving, as I said, was given as a prayer directed to God, who is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who He is and what He has done for us. That was also Paul's affirmation of who Jesus is. He was affirming Jesus, our Lord Jesus Christ, because we've heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all God's people. So Paul had heard of the faith, of their faith in Jesus and the work that they were doing there from what others had told him. And what Paul heard about was their faith in Jesus. Their faith in Jesus. Their faith was more than just belief. I believe. I believe in Jesus. It was more than that. They lived out their faith day by day in what they did and their practices. So they, they had an active faith. That's a good word to put in front of you of faith. Active faith. It works. It shows. It sets an example to people as they see you and know who you are, that you are a person of Jesus Christ who has faith in him. So Paul was pleased to hear about their sacrificial love for each other and for all the other saints. Uh, so far, Paul has commended the Colossians for loyalty to Christ, his redemptive love, and how it was shown to others round about them. So they shared this redemptive love of Jesus to other people, wherever they went, whatever they did. And he had one more affirmation <clears throat> to offer. He pointed to the hope stored up for you in heaven, the great hope that has been stored up through our faith in Jesus Christ and who he was. So hope is not wishful thinking, but the certainty of a glorious life with, with, uh, with Christ in eternity. So uh, when we talk about hope, it's not we hope this happens, we hope I get this tomorrow, hope I can do this. It is an affirmation that is a certainty. Hope is a certainty because of our faith in Jesus Christ and who he is and what he did for us. So that assures us of eternity because of our faith and trust in him. So faith, hope, and love are rooted in the truth of the good news about Jesus Christ. It is good news. It certainly is. Well, we look to verses 6 through 8 and how it continues. He says, uh, the message of the gospel has come to you in the same way the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world. So the gospel was really spreading at this time in the early church. It was booming. All these churches starting after the, um, after the um, uh, persecution in Jerusalem. Boy, people just took off out of Jerusalem, went to every place they could in the world at that time. And there they started churches. And so the work was booming, was spreading all around at this time. So that was an impact on what had taken place after the day of Pentecost that Peter preached that sermon that day. Then they all began to go in many different directions. So Paul was saying not only in Colossae, but everywhere, this truth had been booming, blooming out. Uh, I got... Uh, 
I got off track there. The gospel is bearing fruit throughout the whole world, just as it's been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. Uh, verse, uh, yeah, keep going. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf and who also told us of your love in the spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. One thing about Paul, <laughs> he, he doesn't write very short sentences. They're always long, long. You, you may read several, several words and lines of words and it's all one sentence. So it's kind of hard to remember what he said earlier in the sentence. That was always my uh, problem with reading Paul's writings. They were so long in sentences. But... What he had to say was uh, marvelous. It was the gospel. So wherever in the world the gospel has been preached, it confronted its hearers with truth, the truth that resulted in changed lives. And that's what uh, an encounter with Jesus Christ really entails. It means it represents changed lives. Certainly Paul was a great example of that, how his life was changed uh, on one day. And he did not anticipate something like that happening. But the gospel, when it comes into a person's life, changes the life and should change that life uh, forever. So perhaps fall, Paul felt compelled to make this statement as a challenge to the false teachers. So he was challenging those false teachers. Don't be teaching the wrong things. Anything that's not according to the gospel of Jesus Christ and what he did and his resurrection uh, is false. So we got to be careful that we don't distort the truth or change the truth as so often happens and has happened throughout the ages and happens even today. Some people want to change the truth of the gospel and it's not the same. It's false. It has to be false. We know that. So not only had the true believers heard the gospel, they had come to recognize and experience the truth of the message that Paul was delivering and everybody else, all the other disciples and everybody else who was sharing the gospel, they had come to realize the truth about the message of Jesus Christ and how it changed their lives. So the truth was that God had acted through grace, in grace, through Jesus Christ. Grace, remember that's the beginning point of all that God did. It was grace, grace that brought us Someone said, uh, some, I forgot who uh, wrote a book about it. He said, grace is the last best word in all the English language. Grace. There's no better word than God's grace and what he did for us and shared that with us through his son, Jesus Christ. So they acted in grace through Jesus Christ and he did change us. Well, he said, you learned it from Epaphras. He's the one who started the work there. He called him our dear fellow servant, fellow servant, one of, one, of, one of us, as he was saying. He's one of us. He was identifying with all the others who were ministers and sharing the gospel. Uh, he's a faithful minister on our behalf. He is out there sharing the true gospel of Jesus Christ and what that gospel can do and can change a person's life uh, as they go through their life. And who also told us of your love. So Paul says he's not only sharing the gospel, one of our fellow ministers who's doing a good job, but he also told us uh, of your love in the spirit, how you are responding uh, to his ministry and to the gospel of Jesus Christ and how you're sharing that gospel in and around your community. So uh, that means a lot. Uh, Paul brought to mind this messenger. It was a papyrus, our dear fellow servant what he has done. He had high regard for him as a partner in ministry. Uh, I don't know, um, when we think about partner in ministry, sometimes uh, churches can get a little competitive. You know, they don't want one church to get ahead of them in numbers or anything else. You, you uh, evaluate what a church is doing. So we're all, in the, we're all in the same work with sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. We should not be critical or jealous of another church that's doing an outstanding work. And we may not be doing what we need to be doing. We may need to pick up the pace. So it's not, there's no room for jealousy about what other churches are doing. If they're reaching people for Jesus Christ, we ought to rejoice 
in what they're doing. So there's no room for that in any church. We're to, we to give God thanks for what churches are doing if they are doing a good work in reaching people. So we're grateful for that. So Papyrus founded the church and he provided care. So he was the minister. He was the shepherd of that group of people as he led them and as he worked with them and as he shared the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, we do not know that he um, uh, was in person with Paul. I'm person. We do know that he was in prison with Paul. <laughs> Later on in Rome, he was in prison with Paul. We find that in Philemon verse 23 where Paul says, Papyrus is here with me, and on and on as he said that there, which furthers the, um, which furthered this bond that they had with each other. You know, not only were they fellow ministers of the faith, but they had a strong bond because they were in prison together and they had whatever else they did together. He was talking about that and, and uh, recognizing him for what he was doing and what he had done. So Paul does not... Um, explicitly asked the church at Colossae to pray for him. Uh, sometimes he did in some of his letters. He'd say, pray for me as I go through whatever experience he's going through. But he did not specifically ask or explicitly. But certainly prayer is warranted anytime we should pray for people, pray for our ministers, pray for those who are taking the gospel. Pray. I think one thing we all do, uh, we, we want to pray for missionaries. So we... We'll say, Lord, bless all the missionaries. <laughs> That's kind of a blanket prayer. Uh, sometimes we need to be a little more specific in praying for missionaries that we might know about or know about their work. Lord, I pray for them and their ministry and wherever they are and whatever they're doing. Be a little more specific instead of just a blanket prayer. Lord, bless all the missionaries and all the ministers and all the folks everywhere. Amen. That's a pretty short prayer. And sometimes it may not do much good. So we need to be a little more specific. But prayer is warranted. We are to pray for the protection for those in the ministry of church leaders in carrying out the call of God and the responsibilities that they have been called to. So we are to pray for the protection. And a lot of times hey, in places around the world today, uh, Christians are being persecuted. Ministers are being persecuted. And it even causes some sometimes to lose their lives or to be persecuted in many ways. You, you take you can name a lot of countries today where Christians are criticized or are, are punished or uh, persecuted, uh, mainly because they can't even say that they belong to a Christian group. They can't even say that they're Christian. So they're as in China, they have to have an underground church where Christians get, get together in secret to worship and to pray and to share God's word. So we can pray for the protection of church leaders and what the work they are that they're doing and trying to fulfill the call of God that has been made on their lives. So the gospel is a powerful, as Paul says in Romans 1, uh, the, the, I can't say the beginning, the power of the gospel is stronger than any, oh, now I can't even quote it to you. <laughs> Let me go back. Let me read that Romans 1 real quick. Romans 1. Find Romans 1. I think I'm about there. <laughs> this is strange, isn't it? Uh, here he goes. He says... Um, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. So the power of the gospel. There is a strong power in the gospel for which we are grateful for and which we can give praise to God. The gospel, the gospel um, is strong. It's powerful. Whenever it's declared, whoever shares the gospel of Jesus Christ, it's a powerful tool for all. Uh, the gospel is to be heard, but not just heard, but to be experienced.